Well, Jeremy and Nigel, thanks a lot for the invitation. It is uh, great to be here. And so the reason I'm really talking about plant genome editing today is the um, development of CRISPR-Cas as a system. Um, and what CRISPR-Cas allows is what you see here, which is to make a targeted double-strand break basically anywhere in the eukaryotic genome. And the reason that's useful is that in plants left to its own devices, that'll mostly be repaired using non-homologous end joining. You can break a gene. Or if you provide a donor template, um, you can have homology directed repair and uh, insert whatever sequence you would like. So that's the sort of technological um, rationale. Why are we excited about this from an uh, applied point of view? And the reason is that plant breeding is fantastic. It's really developed improved crops over the years. And we believe that genome editing can be used to achieve the same outcomes that can be achieved through traditional plant breeding, um, but be faster and more precise, and in some cases, um, to make the um, impossible or very difficult uh, possible. So I've divided my talk today into two sections. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the foundational technologies that we believe are required for plant genome um, engineering. Um, and then I'll switch gears and give snippets of a few different examples of how, we, how we've actually used this technology to improve crops. So the four foundations in our mind are double-strand break reagents, CRISPR-Cas, for example, reference genomics, elite line plant regeneration, so the ability to make edits directly in commercial varieties, and then fi finally, um, high-throughput molecular analysis systems. Cas9 is a fantastic reagent, and just to illustrate um, what I mean by that, what this pie chart shows is the results of targeting 144 different genes, so knocking out 144 different genes and more than 144 different experiments. In each of these, we regenerated somewhere between 10 and, and 100 plants, and we asked the question, how many of those plants um, had a mutation in the targeted gene? And you can see that about 40 percent of the time, essentially every plant was edited. Another 53 percent of the time, so now we're up to 95 percent, um, 50 to 90 percent of the plants were edited, and it virtually always works. And just a, a visual example on the right, um, when we disrupt this gene that is involved in yellow development in the air, you can get this nice one to three or, um, segregation when you solve it. One of the limitations of the most used Cas9 system, which is the um, Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9, is that the way all Cas9s work is that there is a guide sequence, an RNA-DNA interaction, and that's the, the primary basis of targeting, but there's also a protein-DNA interaction called the, the PAM, and the PAM for Strep pyogenes is, requires a GG, and so unless you have a GG near where you want to cut, um, you can't cut there. To overcome this limitation, we've collaborated with um, CASIME, which is a spin-out of Vilnius University, as well as New England Biolabs. Um, and what we've done is to take a bunch of different Cas9 orthologs, and you can see a phylogenetic tree here on the left. This is more than 1,000. There are a lot of these in nature. Um, and we characterized uh, more than 100 of them and solved in vitro what their PAM sequences were. And you can see the incredible diversity that comes out of here. And so this is an example of the sort of work we've done to build um, tools um, to um, sort of help expand the genome editing um, toolkit. But really, making double-strand breaks is no longer the rate-limited thing um, in genome engineering. We heard quite a bit about reference genomes um, this morning, and I think what I'll tell you is fully consistent um, with what Jeremy and others said. Um, the point I want to make, jumping off-wise, is that within maize and within many different uh, crops, the diversity is just incredible. So what you see here on the left-hand side is a typical field study of some pioneer corn lines. Um, and if you went out there and looked at them, they would look awfully similar to you. Um, they differ a little bit in height, a little bit in some other features. If you were a maize biologist, you'd be able to pick out some of the subtleties, but you know, not a lot of variation um, sort of at a high level. But the reality is that at DNA level, these things are incredibly diverse, um, much more diverse than, say, humans and chimpanzees. And so if you just sort of ask yourself, you know, would you feel comfortable doing chimpanzee genome editing using a human reference genome, um, it's even worse than that if you're using one plant um, reference genome to edit a different variety. A different way of looking at this is depicted here in this paper that we published um, a long time ago, um, and it's comparing two different extremely well-known maize lines, Missouri 17 
and B73. And this is about a 150 KB um, segment. And what you can see in the middle there is that these are sequences that are shared between the two lines. And then in the top and the bottom, you see sequences that are not. And so if you care, for example, what gene is adjacent to where you're cutting, you really need um, a line-specific reference genome. And the good news is um, that really over the last three years or so, a set of technologies have come to market that enable this to be done inexpensively and quickly. Um, and this is an example of bringing together uh, PacBio, BioNano, and Chromium um, data. Um, and this is a, a de novo maze genome. And what you see depicted here are the BioNano um, scaffolds. And so you can see that those um, end up being often two or three um, per chromosome. If you double click on this, um, this is what it looks like from a pack bio contig um, point of view. Um, so you might have 50 different contigs um, on an individual chromosome. This is chromosome 10. But some of those contigs, many of those contigs are quite big, you know, several megabases um, in size. And then if you drill down even further, and in this case, we've polished this with chromium data, we basically can't find errors. We can look at millions and millions of bases in a row. And with this technology, um, there, there just aren't um, errors that we're seeing. And so this is just such a transformation over where we were five years ago, where we simply didn't have the ability to generate de novo reference genomes. The third foundational technology I mentioned was elite line plant regeneration. Um, so really, there are two choices if you're trying to make an improved crop. One is that you could make that edit in something that's easy to work with from a tissue culture point of view, and then use trait integration to bring that into an elite background. Um, and that clearly takes time, and I'll show you later that it actually is low quality as well. Um, the much better way is to make the edit directly in elite germplasm. And for some applications, like if you're editing multiple things at the same time, this is really the only practical approach. Um, and scientists at Corteva over the last few years have developed a way in monocots to basically achieve um, genotype-independent transformation. And this is through the use of these developmental genes, um, baby boom and whistle, um, expressed in particular ways um, that facilitates the um, regeneration of plants through somatic embryogenesis. You can see an example here. This is a bunch of different um, elite inbred maize lines. None of them were transformable or regeneratable um, with traditional methods. All of them work straight out of the box. Um, one of them, this uh, pH 84Z, was quite low. Um, but with some tissue culture optimization, um, that could be increased as well. And then finally, the, the fourth um, foundational technology is molecular analysis systems. And, and at some level, the, the final analysis that we're doing um, isn't particularly fancy. Um, but the real need here is to have nucleotide level analysis, because you're making nucleotide level changes. And you also need high throughput. And so this is an example of a system we developed called Southern by Sequencing. And the example I'm going to give here is actually um, a transgenic example, but it works much the same for genome editing. So one way of making, a common way of making transgenic plants is to use agrobacterium. Um, agrobacterium is made that contains a plasmid that contains this tDNA. That tDNA is going to be transferred to the plant cell um, using agrobacterium machinery. And so the, the hope is that that gets inserted into the plant genome. The um, southern by sequencing approach is basically to design an extremely large number of oligos. These are about 70 mers. Um, they're biotinylated. And so they can be used in a pull-down assay on genomic DNA from a transgenic plant. And then you can do shotgun aluminum, alumina sequencing. And what you see here is the um, read depth when we take those reads and line them back up against the plasmid. In the middle here, you can see exactly as expected, the tDNA in its entirety has been inserted into the plant genome. But what you can also see is that this short sequence, which corresponds to the backbone, has been inserted. So this is a bad transgenic plant. Uh, it's easy to see here. And we'll throw that away. The other nice thing is because what you're pulling down is not just the sequence that the oligo is um, binding, but also um, what its neighbor is, is that you can see where in the genome this transgenic sequence has been inserted. Um, and therefore, you can see how many copies of it have been inserted by seeing how many different junctions there are. And so in this case, it's very simple. The tDNA has only been inserted one place. Um, we can easily map that um, in the genome. 
um, the little fragment has also only been inserted one place. And the nice thing about this system is that every part of it, from the wet lab part um, all the way through the bioinformatics pipeline, um, is high throughput. So hundreds of samples like this can be run um, in parallel. And as you'll see in my examples, it's often necessary to analyze um, hundreds of plants. And so it's really helpful to have a technology like this. So one of the um, reasons we're excited about plant genome engineering is the idea of getting products to market faster. The transgenic process is extremely slow. A large part of this is the regulatory process, which can take 10 years or more. So it can really be 20 years from the develop, you know, beginning of a transgenic project to getting a product to market. Breeding is faster than that, but breeding is still slow. From the time that you make an initial cross until you're actually selling um, a bag of corn seed, it's at least nine years. And what I'll show you today is that um, we can use genome editing to reduce that time frame um, to four years. The next point I want to make is around the quality of products that can be made through genome editing. So the traditional way of bringing a trait, and this example is for disease tolerance, into an elite background, say a plant with good agronomics, is to cross the two and then take that F1 individual and back cross it to the plant with good agronomics and do that over and over again. And so you finally end up with a plant always selecting for the disease tolerance that is disease tolerant and the vast majority of its genome 98%, 99%, 95% um, has good agronomics. And so at the end of the day, you do, this is done all over and over, um, it works. You get a high quality plant, you get disease tolerance, um, but it has two downsides. One is there's always some unintended donor genetics and it takes several years. The promise of genome um, editing is that you can simply insert that disease gene um, into the um, targeted agronomic background you get the same high quality plant with disease tolerance, much faster, and with zero unintended um, donor genetics. So let me switch over to some examples. The first example I'm gonna give is uh, waxy corn. Um, so most of the corn that's grown um, everywhere in the US um, and elsewhere is called number two yellow dent. And it has a very traditional starch composition. You can see this in potatoes and all sorts of other things, which is about 75% amylopectin, which is branched and 25% um, amylose. Waxy corn contains um, homozygous mutations in the waxy gene. This is a uh, starch um, granule synthetase. And what you get is basically all um, amylopectin. And the reason this is useful is that there are a set of industrial applications where the properties of this modified starch are desirable. So it's used, um, for example, in the Sunday um, paper ads have sort of a shiny um, surface to them. That, in fact, is cornstarch that's made from, from waxy corn. There are a bunch of um, niche applications like that. So how did we make the deletion? Um, we designed a guide upstream of the gene and a guide downstream of the gene. So we're deleting the entire gene um, for KB. We did this in nine different elite inbreds. We obtained deletions in all of them. We conducted southern by sequencing. They were all perfect. We increased the seed so that we could do field testing, and then we did field testing in 2017 and 2018. This corn had the expected phenotype. So actually the, the name waxy corn comes from the appearance of the um, kernels. They kind of look like uh, candle wax um, because the starch is different. And at a glance, um, these looked like they should. Perhaps more convincingly, we did the, the biochemistry and you can see that um, unlike um, wild type material, um, waxy corn has this greater than 90% um, amylopectin concentration. And all of the CRISPR waxy, the two different inbreds, the male and the female, as well as the hybrid, um, had the same composition as well. In 2017, we tested at 27 different locations across the United States. And what we wanted to do is ask the question. So I showed you earlier, I claimed to you earlier that this traditional process of trade integration is imperfect. You know, it works, but it's bringing along some unintended donor genetics. The question is, um, is this any better? And we were pleased to see that the answer is yes, it is. So this is a comparison um, between identical hybrids made through trade integration or through um, direct genome editing. And what you see is that um, the average increase in yield is about five bushels um, per acre. So um, it was just a cartoon before we did this experiment, um, but after we did this experiment, we convinced ourselves that um, this actually is, is really beneficial. I also made this claim that 
this can be a faster product development process. Um, this was sort of our first case study of this, and in fact, it took us 42 months to go from um, essentially designing vectors to two years of field data. So the actual making of the, the lines was only a small portion of that. I showed you a cartoon earlier about the, this claim that we can make a higher quality plant um, and confirm that. So let me switch gears to a different crop, um, different application. Um, the crop here is sorghum, um, but what you see here is a field of a weed called striga, which is a parasite. Um, and the um, infestation caused by striga can be so devastating that when you look at a field, all you see are these beautiful um, pink striga flowers. A paper came to our attention, this is not our work, um, studying um, a mutant that is resistant to uh, striga. Um, and this uh, mutant sorghum um, has a defective gene um, that's involved in strigolactone biosynthesis. Strigolactones are used by striga to trigger germination. And so when they're modified, the striga seeds um, aren't aware that there's a sorghum plant nearby that they could infect, and so they don't germinate. And you can see the nice picture um, in the lower right of how this mut mutant performs in the field. So what we wanted to do here, again, was to um, make this mutation in a relevant background. So this is, this is not a problem in the US. Um, this is only a problem um, in developing countries. And so this is a charitable um, project that we've engaged in. Um, and therefore, the, the germplasm that needs to be modified is lines used by um, African farmers. And so very similar to Waxy, we designed guides upstream and downstream of this gene. Um, we were nervous that not every guide was going to work, so we did a couple different guides at the five prime and the three prime end. It turned out that was overly conservative because um, 50 to 75 percent of the plants we regenerated um, didn't have the gene in this um, variety um, that's widely used in Africa. And so we're now collaborating with some folks um, in Africa, and we look forward to getting both the sort of the greenhouse um, validation of the phenotype and then later the, the field validation. So I mentioned disease earlier. Um, one disease that's problematic in the US for corn is northern leaf blight. This is a fungal disease. Um, what you should see here is a picture of corn with bright green leaves. What you in fact see are lots of um, lesions on these leaves. So this is what a bad infection of northern leaf blight um, looks like. A number of different genes that provide resistance to this are known. Uh, many of them come from sort of Central America or South America, and so they're in varieties that are not adapted um, to use in the U.S. So what we did here is we took one of those genes um, that's known. Um, we surrounded it with some homologous sequence to a location in the genome that we thought would be good for targeting insertion. We used a single guide, and then through homology-directed repair, basically inserted the cisgenic sequence um, into the genome. Took a couple thousand embryos, so you know, a person might be able to work through a couple hundred embryos a day to give you a sense of sort of the magnitude of, of scale here. And we were able to um, uh, rescue or, or select a handful of plants with perfect um, homologous recombination. So these target plants did contain um, a version of this gene expressed at a much lower level. Um, so what we did is we looked at gene expression. And you can see the nulls do have um, some gene from that, just some expression from that endogenous gene. Um, but hemizygous for the cis gene is significantly increased, and then homozygous for the cis gene is dramatically increased. And nicely, that correlates with the disease tolerance phenotype, which you see on the right here, where the um, null plants have quite bad um, infection. The hemizygous plants are actually largely resistance, resistant, and then the homozygous plants are basically um, bulletproof. The final um, example that I'll show you um, is trying to increase intrinsic yield. And so um, several years ago, we collaborated with Dave Jackson at Cold Spring Harbor um, and isolated a bunch of different mutants in this gene called um, FEA3, which is involved in signal transduction um, around um, architecture of, of ears. One allele that was isolated in particular is this FEA3-2 allele, and what we observed um, was that this creates corn ears with altered morphology. They have more kernel rows and a bit of disordering. And in a non-elite background, in sort of a preliminary test, this increased um, yield. 
The question we wanted to ask is, not in this non-elite sort of model system, but in a really elite commercial variety, does this have the same effect? And so we selected this uh, modern uh, Pioneer Hybrid P1197, which um, in one of these uh, yield studies in 2017 um, had an, an amazing um, 542 um, bushels um, per acre. So the question is, we take something that's really highly selected for yield, um, can this mutation uh, move the needle on it? This mutation only differs um, from the wild type in a single amino acid. Um, and you can see that um, here near the, the C-terminus of the protein. The way we did this um, uh, edit was to um, select a guide that was quite nearby. Again, we're constrained by this GG requirement of the strep pyogenes, and so we weren't able to find a cut site that was exactly on top of the amino acid that we wanted to target. So our repair template, which is here at the bottom, contains a set of silent mutations that are going to prevent recutting if this is used for our um, HDR, as well as the um, not so silent uh, mutation that will recreate the FEA3-2 allele. So we did this, relatively small experiment, 1,000 embryos in the male and the female parent um, had to screen 100 or 200 plants you know, of each, but we're able to isolate more than a dozen lines um, with the edit, selected two of each um, to advance for further testing. We were pleased that in the greenhouse, um, immature ears do have an altered morphology. It's pretty easy to see here, especially at the kernel tip that you're getting um, more kernels and larger kernels. And um, similarly, mature ears um, have more kernel rows as well as this disorder in. And so there's clearly a phenotype here. Um, it's a modest phenotype, which is what we're looking for. Um, but what we really care about is what is um, the yield that a farmer would experience. And we are um, now at the stage where we have this material um, in, in uh, bags, and it'll be planted all over the US um, in a few weeks. And this fall, um, we should be able to see um, what its effect is. So I thank you for your attention. The work that I presented here um, was a result of a bunch of different lead scientists, uh, most in the um, AST group, um, but also collaborators in um, trait discovery, the field testing, and the uh, bioinformatics group. And if there's time, um, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thanks. resistant uh, plants, do they have normal interactions with mycorrhizal fungi? So um, for those in the audience that don't know, um, strigolactones have sort of three different um, functions. One, they function as a, as a plant hormone. Um, one, they are involved in interactions um, with the microbial community. And the third is that they recruit um, striga. And so we do not know what the agronomic um, we do not know what the impact will be on either of those other two functions. Um, in, the, in the paper that we didn't work on um, that discussed the initial mutation, um, nothing gross was seen. Um, and it's clear that there are a number of cases where striga is such a problem that minor um, detractions in these other two dimensions would still, it would still be attractive to not be infected by striga. But th this is really a, a preliminary experiment, and I'm not in any way saying it's ready to be um, given out to farmers. But since I have the microphone, I have a follow-up question. Sure. Here. So uh, genome editing in these uh, plants that uh, would be used uh, in countries where striker is a problem, would those countries consider genome editing a GM technology? Would they want these plants? Yeah. So the um, obviously nobody had policies 10 years ago on genome editing. And um, most countries today are in the process of working out their regulations. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, African countries are sort of behind on that. So very few of them, maybe none of them, have actually issued um, guidance on it. We, we would treat this um, as a GMO until they've established um, rules to the contrary. We don't think ultimately it should be treated um, as a GMO, but those policies have not been um, worked out. So I have a question here. Uh, so regarding, you show a lot of examples that are very nice for more qualitative traits. But when we think about quantitative traits, that will be controlled by many alleles in the genome. How do you see genome editing helping there? How many edits can you do per time, like multiplex editing, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, so a few different thoughts. 
One is, as you saw in the HDR experiments, the homology you know, repair experiments that I showed you, you have to screen a large number of plants to find one. And so multiplexing that, when you start out, it, you know, it's kind of the, the function, the product of the two frequencies. That, that's just dead on arrival with the current technology. The only way you could assemble such products would be to cross them and bring them together. In contrast, you saw the super high efficiency of knockouts. And I didn't show you multiplexing per se, but you can sort of you know, infer that multiplexing at a relatively high rate could be possible. And so when it comes to um, removing you know, genes, I think that could be accomplished. There are other technologies that people are working on, um, like base editing, that might be suitable for multiplexing um, and not, um, not just for loss of function. So over here. Um, so in, in these examples that you were showing with the uh, modifying with CRISPR, editing like different crops of interest, are you guys in any case using also gene drives to increase, you know, the chances of, of uh, some particular editing to propagate in cases where you're interfering with some natural population of, of crops? Yeah, so we don't work with natural populations of crops, so the, 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 the simple answer is no. You know, for those in the audience that don't know, there's this notion, or not notion, there's this uh, technology where you can use gene drive uh, to actually um, create alleles that have sig significantly reduced fitness, and even with significantly reduced fitness, they can actually penetrate through an entire population and potentially cause, you know, population collapse. And so people have talked about this with um, mosquitoes. So it's not relevant at all for what we do, because what we do is incredibly far from, from natural populations, right? We have a manufacturing process that's sort of three generations, right? You see, we only sell hybrid seed, it dies. Um, I would make one kind of minor technical point. Um, it, it's not an intentional gene drive, but any transgenic line that contains a Cas9 and a guide is a gene drive because it's not increasing the frequency of that Cas9 and guide, but, but say you had a Cas9 and a guide that was stably integrated and the guide was targeting waxy and you had this in a, in a wild population. Over time, the um, allele frequency of waxy knockouts would go up until it reached saturation, right? So actually, every academic scientist that's working with this um, is creating lots of plants you know, with the gene drive. They're not releasing them um, in the wild. So it's, it's just important to be sort of um, careful about the terminology. Probably not every gene drive is bad. A gene drive re released in the wild is what we want to avoid. Was there one over here? Hi. Um, yeah, so an, a number of studies have been showing that uh, the process of regenerating from a single cell through a mature plant causes some other kinds of alterations, deletions, duplications, translocations. So I'm wondering, is that now part of standard operating procedure when using CRISPR-Cas9? You can clearly show that the target site is exactly what you want, but what about the rest of the genome? Is it standard operating procedure to look at the integrity compared to the starting material? It is not. Um, in maize, it is a part of um, every um, normal sexual cross that transposons get loose and cause rearrangements and deletions um, and translocations. Um, maize is amazing from that point of view. Um, we have several decades of work regenerating um, plants, you know, from single cells in the world of, of transgenics. And um, somal clonal variation is something that exists. Off types are something that happen from time to time exactly as they are in a breeding program, right? And so the um, way that these have been sorted out in breeding programs and in transgenic development programs, you know, for decades is to throw out off types, right? Um, I actually think that with the new methods that we've developed, which go very, very quickly um, from scutellum tissue to a somatic embryo, which then germinates, that um, the incidence of those things is de minimis when compared with just a normal um, meiotic um, zygote fertilization. Are we out of time, Jeremy, or one more?
Uh, you screened and found about a uh, hundred orthologs, uh, which I assume had differing palm sequences. Right. And the good thing about that would be that you know over those hundred orthologs, there'd be uh, palm sequences that are completely orthogonal to your SPCAS9 of NGG. Um, did you do any experiments where you could see if you could use multiple, um, you know, Cas9 variants at the same time, for example, to do deletion activation of multiple genes at the same time, just so that it could be better as a tool? Yeah, we have not done that yet, but I'd bet dollars to donuts that it'll work, right? Um, because these, these, um, these guides are specific to their cognate Cas9 proteins, right? And all of these different Cas9 proteins are similar enough that you know how to add an activation domain or an inhibitory domain. And so it's easy to imagine a, a toolbox where you're doing different things to different genes, not just activating everything or deleting everything or repressing everything. Time's up? Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Donna, again.